Good morning, Dr. Uma. Peace and Pan-Africanism. Welcome to Guadeloupe. Thank you. Glad to be in Guadeloupe. My first time. It's been a long time coming. And I want to thank the good brothers and sisters of the Ethiopian World Federation, local number 72. They're responsible for me being here. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Glad to be here. For those who don't know, you're a certified school psychologist, a doctor of clinical psychology, as well as a Pan-African advocate. I've got many topics I would like to discuss with you today. The first one is linked to black music. Mm -hmm. Dr. Umer, what happened to rap music, which was originally created to protest and to uplift our community? Has it been colonized? Has it been diverted from its primary mission? All of the above. Uh, the original hip hop culture was colonized, co-opted, diverted, polluted, every possible word that you could use. The mistake that I believe was made with hip hop is the same mistake that was made with African territory and resources. What do you mean? Once you bring in an outsider, a European to help you process, promote, to help you perfect and improve a traditional African cultural product, mineral resource, they're going to exploit it for personal gain because Europeans are spiritually unable to practice equality and justice with African people. So whenever you bring them to the table, you're going to end up on the shorthand of the stick because it's not within their psychological realm of possibilities to treat you as an equal. And so with gangsta rap, excuse me, hip hop got polluted into gangsta rap uh -huh. because the corporate giants that control black music in America decided that the time had come for gangsta rap to take over the hip hop culture in order to breed mass incarceration of young black males. So gangster rap in many respects is the marketing scheme for mass incarceration. Everything that gets you arrested is popularized and glamorized in gangster rap music. So in, in this case, is there a way for us to reclaim our hip hop culture? Absolutely. And if so, how? We can reclaim hip hop culture just as we can reclaim African soil, African resource, Caribbean soil, Caribbean resource. The question is, is the commitment and conviction there to take it back? Because what we see with our gangster rappers, they're more in love with the money yep. than the control of this traditional African cultural product. They're more in love with the popularity that the major white companies can give them than they are in being able to control the content of their genre so it doesn't negatively destroy the African community. It's just like African heads of state. Mm -hmm. They're more comfortable with the under the table payments. They're more comfortable with the lavish lifestyle that the Chinese and the French and the Portuguese and the British and the Americans and the Dutch can give them. So at the end of the day, can we take it back? Of course. The white man has two eyes like us, two ears like us, two hands like us, 24 hours in a day like us. The issue is not so much can we overcome it. The issue is whether or not we have become so drunk with the life of luxury uh -huh. that the European has provided us with that we're no longer interested in the sacrifice necessary to take back what is ours. So that's what I'm telling you. Are we ready to forget about the kind of life promoted and given to us by the Europeans and start a new way of life. Is it possible to you? Frederick Douglass said, it's better to raise strong children than repair broken men. I'm saying that to say that I don't think we're ready as a group. I think we're starting to think about getting ready. Uh -huh. So in psychological therapy, when someone comes in as a client, depression, alcoholism, suicidality, psychotic disorder, eating disorder. The first thing I have to do is evaluate your readiness to change. Okay. Because if you're not ready to overcome, we might as well stop until you're ready. Because I can't change you. I'm not a mag magician. I'm not a psychic. I'm a psychologist, you see. So I got to assess you. If you're not 
ready to change, we end the relationship. It's no need for you to pay me your money. Yeah. It's no need to talk about revolution with African people if we're not ready to change. No. I believe we're starting to think about mm -hmm. thinking, thinking about process. making a change. Yep. Are we there? Absolutely not. You cannot go from a social, intellectual, political, and literal diet of white supremacy to African revolution overnight. Uh-uh. There's stages to get ready. So how long will it, will it take, according to you? Generations and generations? The distractions are so great. Uh -huh. The distractions. I believe the European has mastered the distractions more than he has mastered the oppression. The oppression isn't even that important anymore because you got the distractions, social media, this, that, the distraction. exactly. And those distractions have given African people so much comfort that I think a lot of us are okay under oppression as long as we have the distractions. Yeah, man, I agree, I agree. So something else, in the U.S. it seems that black people are more likely to vote Democrats than Republicans. Mm -hmm. However... It seems that none of those parties have found a solution to help the community come through. So how do you feel about that? I believe that the American African community needs to divest from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh -huh. and divest from every other party that's available. Now, of course, America is a two party dictatorship. Yep. You're not even getting heard if you're not on the Democratic ticket or the Republican ticket. You uh -huh. understand? Historically, we were Republicans because that was the party that gave birth to the fight not to end slavery, but to control it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected in 1933, black people began to switch because his New Deal programs after the stock market crash was interpreted by a lot of black people uh, 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 as having some teeth in it that could benefit them in their struggles. Uh -huh. So we began to go Democrat and we've been voting predominantly Democrat from 33 until now. Uh -huh. That means that in another decade, we would have voted overwhelmingly Democrat for a century, uh -huh. 100 years uh -huh. Uh -huh. in 2033. What have the Democrats done so great for African people in America that justifies that type of loyalty? Look at Joe Biden, completely ignore black people. Yeah. He gave the Asians the anti-Asian hate bill he gave the Native Americans an anti-violence bill. Uh, he gave the transgenders anti-transgender bill. He has taken care of the Ukrainians, the Afghanis, and now we have the migrant crisis. Now, here's the thing with the migrant crisis. When Joe Biden was elected, he said, I want to fast track four million illegal immigrants to American citizenship. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Black America wasn't listening. The purpose of fast tracking illegal immigrants to citizenship is the Democratic Party is tired of needing the black vote to succeed. Uh -huh. They're tired of looking like they're the party of black people, which they are not. Yep. But in order to realize that they want to bring the immigrant in and replace the black vote with the immigrant vote. And at this point, they have no choice because they've done nothing for black people. According to the polls, Joe Biden is down 30 points in his approval rating with the American African community. He can't depend on black folks to win next year. Yeah, okay. All right. This is why the migrants are coming. He want to bring them into the black community like he's doing in Chicago. Mm -hmm. They're taking over. Chicago is the only predominantly black congressional district in the United States. That's why Obama became senator through Chicago, yep. then U.S. senator. Because it's the only overwhelmingly black congressional district. They want to bust it up. Yeah. They want to kill it okay. with migrants. Yeah. Turn Chicago into a Latino community. Yeah. Yeah. You understand that? So it's a kind of replacement. Yes. Right? replacement. It's, a it's replacement. It's a purge. It's a complete replacement. They're going to replace blacks with the multicultural vote. Now, as I've taught before, and we might have discussed this in our previous conversation, I've been telling American Africans, British Africans, Canadian Africans, South Africans, multiculturalism is one of the new faces of white supremacy. I'm not going to kill you with the white hand. Uh -huh. I'm going to make it look like I'm being inclusive of every other color. But what I'm really doing is I'm using brown, yellow, red, and white 
to drown out black. Yeah. And because black people have been psychologically comatose by religion into believing we got to be multicultural, we don't even recognize how browns, yellows, whites, and reds are being mm -hmm. used to suffocate black people's political agenda. So America, after the migrant crisis, you're going to see a significant reduction in black political influence and power as a result of them just coming in and taking over. Now, check this out. Mm -hmm. They could have took the migrants to the Latino section of Chicago. There's a large Latino section. Okay. They did not take them there. Why? Why not take them to their own? Why? Because they need them to replace blacks. Okay. We don't need you in the Latino community. We need you to get rid of these blacks. And they took in $51 million of black Chicago taxpayer money to fund the migrants. Now, all those public schools were shut down in Chicago. They said they couldn't afford them. For years, they've been shut down. Uh -huh. We can't afford to operate the public schools. Well, if you can't afford to operate the public schools for black children to learn, how in the hell did you manage to open all of them up, renovate them, turn them into apartments for the migrants, and they're going to open school back up? Right. The point I'm making is America can solve every problem it created for black people. They don't want to. We're the throwaways. They want to exterminate and eliminate the 2020 decade is the decade of African racial extermination. It started with COVID. They killed off all of our elders through the COVID vaccination and the COVID disease. The purpose of COVID in the American theater uh -huh. was to kill off as many elderly African-Americans, eliminate them from social security dependency so you can now take their social security funds of the dead blacks and give it to the Ukrainians when they show up in America. And right now, Ukrainians can qualify for SSI income, having never worked or paid a tax a day in their life. This is the purge. Okay, all right. I didn't, I didn't see it like this. Because at the same time, as we're talking about, you know, politics, do you think that there's a space today in the politi po political game to create a party fully dedicated to the black cause and the black agenda, or is it too late? It's never too late. There's an African proverb. Whenever you see a black baby born, that's a message from God. He's not done yet. Uh -huh. You still have a chance. It's never too late. But again, how much are we willing to sacrifice? See, the proverbial or the operative word here is sacrifice. We haven't sacrificed in a long time. You understand? It's been almost 50 years since there's ever really been any true sacrifice. And the problem with the American African, you see it in Europe, you see it in Canada, you see it anywhere we live in a predominantly European context. You see it in Holland, you see it in France. We're so comfortable with the quality of life that the white power structure provides that many of us suffer a cognitive dissonance. On one hand, we feel like revolutionaries, but on the other hand, I'm loving the life that the white power structure has given me. You see that? Got you, got you. Exactly. So the quality of life, the education, the college degrees, the jobs, the homes, the cars, all of this useless material garbage is distracting us from a greater freedom because it's been so long since we had real freedom. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's hard to value what you never had. Yeah. See, when they enslaved our ancestors, it was easy to fight. You know why? I know what freedom is. I just had it. I'm going to die for this. Uh -huh. So in Georgia, we had Ebo Landing where enslaved Africans got off the boat, turned around and walked right into the river and drowned themselves because yep. they tasted freedom. Yep, of we haven't had it. We were not born free. Mm -hmm. We were born half free. Yeah. You see that? Yeah, yeah I got you. Got you. And, and because we're comfortable with half freedom because we never had whole freedom. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's like you like your chicken made a certain way. But if this is the only way you've ever had the chicken, you don't need that. But once you taste that chicken, you realize you that. never come. <laughs> you understand? So that's the issue. We never Got tasted it. real freedom, yeah. so it's okay for us to content ourselves with half slavery. Because you know what? At the same time, I've got the feeling that things are changing or evolving in a way. So now I'm getting back more to Africa and in the Caribbean mm -hmm. because I've got the feeling that more and more people today, more and more black people from our community, have the feeling that you know the black politicians are just puppets in the service of external governments and not in the service of their own brothers and sisters. So I really have the feeling that there is a kind of wind of revolution because the people are realizing 
that mm. something goes wrong mm. and that maybe they can't trust or they don't have sometimes the feeling that our brothers and sisters who are politicians are not defending them but are defending a system that doesn't help them. What do you think about this? I agree with you. I think our people have been aware for some time that our leaders are really misleaders uh -huh. who serve a greater European agenda first in their own pocketbooks second. Uh -huh. Here's the issue though. Although you don't like what they're doing, if they invited you to be a part of it, would you refuse it? The point that I'm trying to make is we have to separate those of us who want true liberation from those of us who just want a more comfortable existence. I often say that a lot of Africans don't want to be free. They just want a better existence under the white power structure. All right. You've seen this when so many revolutionaries think they want change until they're offered a better life. And when they're offered a better job, a better house, a better education, they're willing to exchange true freedom for more comfort under the ruling hierarchy. You understand? Yeah. So for me, that anger is not an anger of a revolutionary. It's not an anger that says, I want a new reality. I want an independent existence. It's an anger that says, you need to make me more comfortable. Uh -huh. I'm not trying to take you off the throne. I just want you to make me more comfortable. Yeah, give me a bigger bow. Give me a bigger bow. So until we get beyond comfort to liberation, because guess what? Liberation will not be comfortable. True freedom for African people will not be comfortable. Take Guadeloupe. If Guadeloupe pushes for independence, those first 25 years will be hell be hard. because France is going to sabotage everything they can. They're going to sabotage your food. They're going to sabotage your import export. They're going to sabotage your infrastructure, your institutions, your way of life. The same thing they did when they pulled out of Africa. Every colonizer, when they pulled out of Africa, they made life worse to see if you really want this the way you want this, because we're not going to give you any comforts at all. Yep. So if you don't believe in true freedom, for Guadeloupe, then you say, uh-uh, I don't want no independence from France. You know what the hell my next 20 years are going to look like if we get independence? But if you believe in true freedom, which means you're thinking long term, it ain't about me. It's about my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. I'm going to suffer these next 25 years, but for the rest of eternity, they will be free. So, yeah. So it's like having a long term future. Absolutely. A true revolutionary is selfless. You know why? Because as the most honorable Marcus Garvey said, you will not live. You are not likely to live to see the fruits of your labor. It will be your descendants. A true revolutionary is selfless. If there's selfishness in the revolutionary, you must watch that man. You must watch that woman because a true revolutionary knows I may have to give all and I may receive nothing. I'm, I'm, uh, I agree. So you know what? I'm changing topic. Dr. Uma, your expressions and phrases will soon get into the dictionary. <laughs> Snow bunny crisis. Yeah. Why Black queens forever. Uh, yeah. Snow bunnies <laughs> never. So yeah, so tell us, you know, what that is for those who don't know. Yes. Snow bunny crisis. The snow bunny crisis relates to the tendency for black men in European societies mm -hmm. to pursue white women as their mates at a rate that exceeds what any man of any other color does with regard to interracial dating. Black men love white women and it's because of racial inferiority. It's because I need validation. It's because I've been brainwashed to look at my own woman as being less than. It's because I want my children to look like my oppressor in order for me to feel like a man. So it is a psychological sickness born of post-traumatic slavery disease and post-traumatic colonization disorder. And it is destroying and eroding the foundation of the traditional black family all across the world. So does it mean that you're still against anti-racial marriage? Absolutely. I do not support it. I'm not against the white woman or the red woman or the brown woman or the yellow woman. Human being, I will respect you. 
But the family is the most essential institution of the black community. You lose that, you lose everything. In America, only one out of every four black women will get married. It's not much better in the UK or Paris or Canada or South Africa, you see. So if I want to save black people, I got to save the black family. Moreover, marriage is an economic alliance. Women on average outlive men. So if I marry a snow bunny, she's not going to take any of my wealth, any of my estate, any of my savings and bring it to Guadalupe and build a school for black children. Kobe Bryant was a billionaire. Uh -huh. He left all that money to a Latino woman. She's not going to bring any of that money back to Philadelphia to help our children. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, the former middleweight boxing champion. He died as a result of the COVID vaccination. Uh -huh. A white woman inherited his estate. She's not going to take any of that money to a black community. And that's why I look at interracial dating and marriage as a form of financial betrayal and economic sabotage. So if a brother comes to you and tells you, you know what? Uh, Dr. Uma, love doesn't have complexion. Love doesn't have color. And I'm going to say, oh, you are a coon. Get your ass up out of my face. <laughs> so you know what? Something else. Today, you know, you've got more and more blockbusters such as Black Panther, Spider-Man, mm -hmm. or The Little Mermaid that feature black heroes. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's inspiring for our youth? No. Why? It is psychologically entrapping our youth. Let's look at the first Black Panther. The first Black Panther was a CIA psychops. What? CIA psychops. Why? Killmonger and Prince T'Challa. Killmonger wanted to destroy African culture and root to destroying his oppressor. He wanted to destroy white supremacy, but he wanted to destroy African culture too. So he was a reactionary. Uh -huh. T'Challa was a selfish ass Negro leader who didn't care nothing about the African diaspora. This is your protagonist and antagonist. Which one is good? Which one is bad? Because your character is no good for African people. Your character is no good for African people. And then on top of that, you have a white CIA agent Ross who helped save the day for Wakanda at the end of the movie. I beg your pardon? The CIA murdered Lumumba? The CIA overthrow in Kruma, the CIA murdered Malcolm King. You can go on and on. Nearly every African leader assassinated. The CIA was directly involved or provided intelligence for it. Even when Nelson Mandela was captured before the Ravonia trial, mm -hmm. the CIA helped the apartheid government track down Mandela. How can the CIA agent be a hero in a story about African people? Let's go further. Uh -huh. Why did you see no black love in Black Panther 1? You didn't see no children being loved by their mother. You didn't see no childbirth. You didn't see no women carrying children. Wait a minute. Wakanda is an African nation on the continent. Uh -huh. No children, no mother, no man, woman, and child because it was a psychological operation. Movies are used by the U.S. power structure to plant seeds and condition young, innocent, impressionable minds. And then when they come back for Black Panther 2, you see a community of Latinos who have the same powers, if not more, than the Wakandans. What good is Wakanda if the Latinos got vibranium? The Latinos got the power and the Latinos whipped our behinds through the whole movie, even killed Angela Bassett. She gets murdered in the movie and there's no revenge for her at all. And did you know that Zuri who took over as the Panther, which was also part of the psych ops uh -huh. because we want to kill black masculinity and replace it with black feminism. You see that? We don't need the black man. Put the black woman in front. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did you know that there was a scene where Zuri was supposed to have a, lun a love interest with Namor, the leader of the underwater Latinos? They were supposed to be intimate. They cut the scene. Okay. You mean to tell me he killed her mother? And now she about the bunny hop with the Latino. Insane. It was a psychops. Now you go to uh, Spider-Man, which I haven't seen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Little Mermaid, which I haven't seen. Okay. Right. But I'm told that especially in the Little Mermaid, people telling me it's absolutely ridiculous. Her father white. Her love interest white. All her sisters are of all other colors. You look at Spider-Man, he crushing on the white girl. And then people say it's just multiculturalism. Really? 
So when is Iron Man going to fall in love with a black woman? When is Superman going to fall in love with a black woman? When is Batman going to fall in In other words, if this is all colorblind multiculturalism, yeah. if we got to fall in love with them, when do their leading heroes start falling in love with us? It's one-sided. Only when it's African people do we have to multiculturalize the cartoon. When it's white folks, it could be white on white love. And this is all psychops conditioning black children to not want each other and seek love outside the race, which means what? The future of the black family is dependent upon white participation. All right. Okay. 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 So, you know what? Now, Mr. Dr. Umar, I'm now coming back, you know, to local issues. In Guadeloupe, the French government and their administrative court recently forbade a group of brothers and sisters to open a pan-African school. So the reasons that they put forward, so first, the educational content was not detailed enough. That could lead to separatist tendency. So that was the first one. The second one, they also considered that the positions of the project holders were contrary to the values of the French Republic. And the last one, they also found a safety defect within the premises that was supposed to host the school. What are your thoughts about this, especially when many communities have their own school within the French Republic? The French would be foolish in their selfishness to allow African people to liberate the minds of their children. The British would be foolish in their selfishness. The Portuguese would be foolish in their selfishness. The Americans would be foolish in their selfishness to allow African people to properly educate their own children. The most honorable Marcus Garvey said, liberate the minds of men and you ultimately liberate the bodies of men. Mm -hmm. So from their perspective, understanding who they have been to us in the world for the past 500 years, they are in a stage of paranoia. They recognize that there is a general awakening of consciousness throughout the French empire for African people. Mm -hmm. They see this school as a threat to their continued psychological domination of the French African, whether it's uh, the French African on the continent, the French African in the Caribbean, the French African in France, it is a threat. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they're going to come up with every excuse they possibly can to deny that education. The structural issue in the building, that's nothing. Get another building. Of course. But they're still going to find something else because they just don't want it. Mm -hmm. All of these excuses are just strategies to delay it because they don't want it, but they don't want to openly say that. You understand? Mm -hmm. I believe that it may be almost impossible for us to independently educate our African children here in Guadeloupe without Guadeloupe first becoming independent. It may be tough. Because if the French are taking that hard of a stance, I kind of feel like they're never going to give it to us unless Guadalupe gets its independence first. Yeah. But this speaks to how revolutionary independent education is. Because the liberation struggle must be born in the minds of its children. You, you understand that? Yeah, you. It must come from the mind of the child. And so for the French, for the British, for the Americans, for the Dutch, for the Portuguese, they understand that this climate of wokeness throughout the African world is contagious. And they also see that there's a decline of their legitimacy politically and economically on the world stage. So they're going to press down on us even harder as they struggle with the Chinese and struggle with the East Indians and struggle with the Cubans and struggle with the Russians. You understand? Mm -hmm. So the way that they see it. The last thing I can afford to do right now is let the Africans begin to take control over their destiny. I got to hold them in check until I get everything else right in my empire. So I say we continue to fight, though. Mm -hmm. There probably need to be protests. There probably needs to be a protest at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because as long as Guadeloupe is French territory, you're subjects of the French. And as a result of that, there are human rights at question here. And you could also make the argument from a genocidal standpoint mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that what the French are doing to Africans in Guadeloupe meets the definition of genocide to include not allowing them to educate their own children from an ethnic and cultural perspective. So I think there's a lot we have to pull on here before we throw in the towel. But there's a strong chance that we don't get education for African children until we get independence for Guadeloupe. And, you know, so still speaking about uh, schools, you set up your own school, FDMG Academy. So Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey Academy, a school for black boys scheduled to open in September 2024. I know you've been working hard on this project for a while. People criticize you for many reasons. What steps have you been through to finalize this project? Well, just to give people a quick summary, mm -hmm. we started raising money in 2014 because we wanted to purchase the former St. Paul's College and HBCU in Lawrenceville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. We were unsuccessful. The Chinese bought it. So then we started looking for a regular day school. In 2019, we purchased the former black charter school in Wilmington, Delaware, which is now the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Mm -hmm. Renovations right now are 99 percent done. We have a little bit of HVAC repair and then we're done. Right. Of course, we have to beautify our paint and all that later floors down. All beautification. So I'm looking at having a grand opening for the community in December of 2023 okay. for Kwanzaa. And then we hopefully open up the school next year in 2024. This is the first school in American history built exclusively with the funding of the African diaspora. So for, Never the, before done. for those who would like maybe to to sponsor or to help, what what? Yes, they for do? those who want to donate um, in the country, you can use Cash App, dollar sign FDMG school. In the diaspora, you can use PayPal, paypal.me slash FDMG Academy. You can also mail, check a money order payable to P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, 19809. And I have to say thank you to the African diaspora because we get donations from the Caribbean, from Africa, Australia, Europe, Canada, throughout the states. This is truly, arguably, the first truly Pan Africanist Academy we had on a global scale from a perspective of all African hands donated to make this a reality. A lot of people didn't think it would happen. With regard to the detractors who criticize of the timeline and all types of unsubstantiated uh, allegations of uh, financial improprieties. Where's your evidence? And why are we so impatient with an independent relevant institution when we haven't built anything for ourselves in quite some time? You understand me? Uh -huh. So the people complaining, it's interesting because you have built nothing at all. And since you have no experience building an institution, how can you criticize one? Yeah, this one is a little message to the haters, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but I love my haters. I want you to hate more. I need you to hate harder because a bird cannot fly except against the wind. And the prince of Pan-Africanism cannot rise except against the energy of the hate. So I love my haters because they provide me with a source of inspiration. I'm not against haters at all. In fact, when we open up, I'm going to give our gifts to the haters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? So talking about haters, united we stand, mm -hmm. divided we fall, mm -hmm. should be our motto. Absolutely. Dr. Umar, what relations do you have with the nation of Islam, mm -hmm. which seems to have the same vision mm -hmm. as yours as far as black people's upliftment is concerned. Well, I have tremendous respect for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, as well as the Nation of Islam as a whole. Uh -huh. A lot of very good, decent brothers and sisters there. I have a lot of supporters amongst the ranks. Uh -huh. uh, it is the closest thing to the Honorable Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Of course, we know Elijah Poole, who became the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was a member of Marcus Garvey's UNIA, and he copied the Garvey program in creating the nation of Islam, but there's differences. We believe in Pan-Africanism, complete, total liberation and salvation for African people globally. We do not have a religious orientation, nor do we have a religious agenda, as do our brothers and sisters within the nation of Islam. So with that being said, we have far more in common than we have differences. And I believe that we can unite upon our commonalities, but I think also it would be a disservice to overlook the fact that the program of the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey is not the program of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. All right, okay. And last question I'm going to ask you, my brother. With the messages that you convey, don't you sometimes fail for your life? No, sir. When I study Malcolm and when I study Medgar 
And when I study Martin and when I study Nkrumah and Lumumba and Cabral and Sankara, when I study the assassinated giants amongst our ancestors, a message comes to me that you must discipline your fear to be effective amongst African people because fear from an African spiritual perspective can become a self fulfilling prophecy. You meditate and you uh, ponder over the fear so much that you give rise mm -hmm. to the very atmosphere that takes you out of here. Mm -hmm. Some of Malcolm's closest associates, some of Dr. King's closest associates felt that they had become so overcome with the fear of death that they secretly may have wished to die. I don't ever want to get to that point. You understand me? So like any man, fear exists for me, right? But I have to discipline myself. I have to take charge of any apprehensive expectation I have about my personal safety because it will compromise me in the mission. Understand, every leader who has sold out America, Africa, Caribbean, Europe, Asia, South Pacific, Canada, Central and South America, every leader we've had mm -hmm. who has ever sold out, it was either greed or fear that did them in. You understand? Mm -hmm. So as a true leader of African people, as a true revolutionary activist and Pan-Africanist organizer, you have to weed out any aspect of greed in your character. Mm -hmm. I think I've done that. I'm not in love with nothing a white man makes. You understand? I'm good on greed. Mm -hmm. The other part is the fear. You have to make sure that there is nothing he could intimidate you with that would cause you to misrepresent the suffering of your people. And in fact, when Europeans are around me, I find myself going harder than I usually do because I want to make sure on a subconscious level, I'm not softening my tone because of the presence of the white power structure. You see, you. Yeah, yeah, so you. It, it, it is a demon that must constantly be tamed and controlled lest it suffocate your love for your people. Fear, I would argue, is still today uh -huh. the greatest method of control for black people. It is the fear of losing my job, the fear of losing my reputation, the fear of losing my education, the fear of incarceration, the fear of assassination. The number one weapon the white power structure uses right now, fear. So what you mean is that if black people stop fearing, they could step ahead. Oh, my goodness. Once we achieve divine fearlessness, white supremacy is over. Once we as a people achieve divine fearlessness, no more fear of a bullet, no more fear of assassination, no fear of incarceration, white supremacy ends. Because at that point, what do you use to keep us back? A people who are willing to die to be free will be free of course yeah. yeah i'm talking about i'm i'm thinking about the maroons yes who you know sacrifice their yes. life for for the freedom for their freedom and for absolutely. the freedom of the next generation absolutely a people willing to die for freedom will have it yep. because there's nothing that keeps them from giving their life to obtain the objective got you got you so brother dr uma that was a real pleasure to have you with us today likewise my home is your home. One more time, welcome to Guadalupe. Thank you, brother. Glad right. to be here. Glad to be Guidance here. Guidance and protection, my brother. Give thanks. Give All thanks. Right. Blessed love. <laughs>